Ladies and gentlemen, General Flynn. Good morning, everyone. Grab a seat. Oh, what a nice place here. Well, good morning. Happy 2024 to all of you. And uh, let me just start by saying congratulations to uh, all of you here uh, at the school and college. You're, uh, you're here, uh, obviously, because of your performance, but probably more importantly, because of, uh, of your potential. But I'll also tell you uh, that the, uh, the days, months, and years after this, <clears throat> There's a uh, there's a responsibility that you bear as a result of having this experience and then going back to the force, going back to your country, uh, and going back and and uh, and serving uh, your soldiers and your citizens to uh, secure peace. Really, so let me just tell you, uh, thank you because the sacrifices that you have made have been extraordinary, but the ones you're going to continue to make are uh, going to be equal, if not more demanding. Uh, I'll start by, I think I'll, there's kind of sort of two parts to this. I'll talk about how I see the threat uh, in our area of operations in the Pacific, what we're doing uh, to counter that threat, um, and then I'll uh, and then I'll talk about uh, about being a colonel or about being a senior leader at the echelon just below a flag officer. Of, you know, the role of a colonel, uh, the command at the 06 level and the differences between 05, 06 command and then flag officer command and then also just that that seam. That is really, really important uh, in the Army as the senior field grade, um, or in all of the service, the senior field grade officer um, in your particular service. Um, and then I'm going to have a bit of a family discussion with the Army colonels after it's over. You'll have to come to the front. There'll be no collection, but I'll have to come up here. Okay. <laughs> all right. So. Uh, let me start by saying before I get into a uh, a map here with a few builds that in my almost 40 years of doing this work, I have never seen the security situation, at least in in our theater of operations, or I would say globally, that is as chaotic, um, unhinged, <laughs> uh, violent and unpredictable than we have right now. And I thought there were other periods in my I saw sort of more youthful days where uh, it was pretty chaotic and pretty violent. Um, but I think it's safe to say that uh, right now, uh, depending on you know where you sit and how you feel, I would tell you it's uh, it's a very, very serious uh, global security situation, and it is one where it's going to take every bit of energy that you have to help keep things uh, from going in the wrong direction. And we're going to all need to work together to make sure that that does not happen. So let me transition quickly, if you don't mind. There's a couple of builds here. You cannot talk about the Indo-Pacific without a map. It's just simply too big. So I'm going to walk you around the region. I'm going to try to do this first part in about 20 minutes, and then uh, I, I really, really do want to get to questions because the most important part of all this is the, you know, the 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 back and forth between what's on your mind and at least my responses to uh, or my perspective on uh, trying to give you. A, my view on uh, answering your question. Okay, in this first ellipse, and I'll just go basically South Asia, Southeast Asia, Oceania, homeland, Arctic, Northeast Asia, and then into the um, the eastern portion of China and the first island chain, et cetera. Okay, this first ellipse. What I'm basically pointing out here is that you've got 
the Western Theater Command in China, and you have aspects of the Belt and Road going on here. There's routes being cut through Pakistan. There's routes being cut through the through the uh, through Central Asia. That was once a four month trip. This is now a four week trip. Okay, you've got a we've got a really serious situation going on in Myanmar. You've got routes being cut through Myanmar. There's there's contact. There's violence, there's fighting, there's infrastructure being built all along the line of actual control and Bhutan and Nepal and India. You've got the Rohingya refugee crisis. That's 1.2 million refugees in the Rohingya camp, okay? In a place called Cox's Bazaar, I was down there earlier last year. There's 30,000 babies a year being born there. Most of the people in that camp are 27 and under, and they don't have any shoes or, or shirts on, okay? It's a major, you don't hear anything about it, but that is a problem, okay? Um, you've got, uh, you've got uh, seaports, airports, airfields being constructed in the uh, Cocoa Islands. You've got access control, okay? So the situation there is challenging, very challenging. Next build. Uh, Southeast Asia, a lot, of, a lot of positives here. Of course, I won't go into great detail on what's actually happening or what has been happening largely in the South China Sea. That's a story long in the making. What I will point out is these, uh, what looks to be soccer goal posts, those are dams. And China has doubled the amount of dams in the last three years than they did in the previous five years along the Mekong River to, to do what? To choke water, fresh water. Water along the Mekong, water in Southeast Asia is life. It's power, it's ag, it's energy, it's everything, you name it, okay? So that is not also a good situation there. But in large measure, I would say there's some positive things going on in Southeast Asia, but it is still a very, Difficult situation. Next build. The doorstep of the homeland to the United States. This is where the plates of Micronesia, Melanesia, and Polynesia come together. Okay. So there's money bags out there and there's storm warnings. But the fact of the matter is this that the Chinese are working, they are doubling down on access into those locations. They get, they bring money, they get a, an official, be it business, political, military, you name it. They get into a loan agreement, they can't pay the loan back, and when they can't pay the loan back, they move to take terrain. What kind of terrain? They take warehouses, piers, ports. They get into the electrical grid, they get into the IT backbone, and it's very, very difficult to untangle these small island nations from that kind of uh, insidious activity. So very difficult, a lot of challenges there, and a lot at stake, albeit it doesn't look uh, on the map to be daunting, but that is, uh, the, as I said, the doorstep to the homeland. Next build. America's day starts in Guam. The homeland begins in the second island chain, okay? We have COFA agreements and we have a U.S. territory. And I, I make that ellipse from the second island chain to the first, I'm sorry, to, from the second island chain to admittedly, if you wanna to refer to it as, sometimes it is the third island chain, but the fact of the matter is that previous ellipse in Oceania sits on the doorstep of the homeland the homeland is threatened by what North Korea is doing right now. It is threatened by the Chinese, <clears throat> Chinese, and it is also threatened by the Russians because they have a role and they are playing a role out in the Pacific. Next build. The Arctic. The Arctic is competitive space. And if you can cut your, uh, if you can cut your movements down by somewhere, some estimates between like 14 and 21 days, you can move a lot of commerce over the top of the planet. 
and open up access to other locations. This has to do with shipbuilding. This has to do with the types of ships that are being built. This has to do with research. This has to do with international uh, boundaries and international law. But the fact of the matter is the Arctic is a competitive space. In fact, the reason I'm here this week is there's an Arctic war game going on that we're doing with the 11th Airborne Division because the U.S. Army just created in the last couple of years an airborne division in the Arctic because of the importance of it. Okay, so this is how I sort of categorize the Arctic. The Russians are in the Arctic Circle looking out. The Chinese are, are, are outside the Arctic Circle looking in. And the United States sort of has a foot astride each, the boundary of the circle. So we're, we're kind of in when we want to be, and we're out when we're, when we don't, when we're, when we got other things going on. But my point to everyone, and I'm, and I'm happy to hear, at least I think the DOD is putting out some type of an Arctic strategy here, uh, I'm told in the next couple of months. But we, we created one I was, when I was the G357 in the Army in 20 and 21. And then we had an implementation plan that we have been doing, at least up in Alaska. The point I'm making is competitive space, and it is, uh, it is fertile grounds for global competition between state actors, nation states, to be uh, in and out of that area doing a wide range of things. Next build. Um, this is the Eastern Army Military District. The Eastern Army Military District, basically about 80% of that force came out of the Eastern Army Military District. It went to Belarus. It was a primary uh, element in the attack into Kiev. They got their clocks cleaned. And as everybody knows, that has all been repositioned around into uh, the Eastern Ukraine. The bigger point I'd make here is that Putin basically took his land forces from the east and he has committed them and they uh, effectively do not have an army in the east. But what they do have out in the east is deep stores. So they have a lot of material out there going back to their old Soviet Union days. Um, and what they're doing now is taking some of that and retooling it. <laughs> and then they're moving it. Uh, and they ha obviously have access to it, and then they can get it into factories, do things with it to keep feeding his war machine in Ukraine. So fact of the matter is um, there are uh, there's a lot of things out there. We could talk about whether you know that's effective or not, but he you just all need to know that he's accessing that those deep stores that he has out there to again uh, create. Uh, opportunities for material to go to his forces in the east or, or in uh, in uh, in the Ukraine. Next build. Okay, so we'll build Northeast Asia, and then the rest of the theater commands in China. So for those that are not aware, so a a a a reorganization of the Chinese military happened in the 1415 time frame. But I'll just point this out. North Korea is firing, testing. In fact, right now they're, they're, they're shooting artillery in and around the uh, demilitarized zone. The uh, Chinese arsenal that has built, that has been built here, this A2AD arsenal is a juggernaut. And I would make two major points here. China has three things that we do not have. They the first thing they have is they are operating on interior lines because they're 100 miles away from an objective called Taiwan. The second thing they have is they have magazine depth. They have a lot of weapons, an awful lot of weapons. And then the third thing they have is they have mass. They have a lot of things, ships, airplanes, people, units, etc. So those three things are a challenge for us given the geometry of this geography. Okay, the second thing that they have is that they have created an A2 AD arsenal that is primarily designed, primarily designed to defeat 
our air and maritime power. Secondarily, it is designed to de deny, deter, and disrupt our space and cyber capabilities. Notice I did, I did not say that it is designed to find, fix, and finish distributed, mobile, lethal, non-lethal, networked, reloadable, dispersed land forces. Land forces. When I say land forces, I mean land power, and there's kind of four components to it. There's the Army, because we're the biggest. There's the Marine Corps, which is the next biggest. There's Special Operations Forces, which is kind of the next biggest. And then the, actually the largest element is the network of allies and partners that exist out here. This theater is not a air and maritime theater. Let me say that again, it is not an air and maritime theater. That map is filled with blue, and I know the theater is named after two oceans, but there's also two continents out there, the Asian continent and the Australian continent. And there's this archipelago land bridge that connects these two continents. This is a joint theater. It's got joint challenges and problems, and it's only going to be solved by combined joint and multinational solutions. Armies, and, and, I, and I know that like I catch all kinds of flack for what I just said and what I'm about to say, but armies and land forces in the Indo-Pacific, they are the security architecture that binds this region together. Why? India, 80% of its military, army. Thailand, 70% of its military, army. Indonesia, 75% of its military, army. Philippines, 70% of its military, army. Japan, 65% of its military, army. Vietnam, 90% of its military, army. Look, should I keep going? The point I'm making, the point I'm making is these countries cannot afford large air forces and large navies. They have large armies, why? Because armies defend their territorial integrity. Armies protect their national sovereignty. Armies protect their people. Armies protect their wealth. So, They have interior lines, mass, magazine depth. They have an A2AD arsenal that is a juggernaut that's been created really for the last 20 plus years, but certainly in the last 10 years. And that A2AD arsenal is designed to defeat air and maritime power primarily and secondarily to defeat space and cyber. So. This is why land power and the land power network that is the security architecture that binds this region together is so vitally important to peace, stability, security, and maintaining, maintaining some order. <laughs> next build. Now I'm gonna tell you before you hit the next one, just let me no, just pause for a second. So the national defense strategy has what I'd say, I'll refer to them as three pillars. Uh, integrated deterrence, campaigning, and building enduring advantage. And then the combatant commander, Admiral Aquilino, my, my, my joint commander who I work for, he has a theater campaign plan at the combatant command level. And in that theater campaign command, uh, plan, it directs us to do certain things. And there are three ways that U.S. Army Pacific, as the TJ flick in that theater, is contributing to the combatant commanders and states, and then the three pillars of the national defense strategy. Again, integrated deterrence, campaigning, building during advantage. First build. First way we're doing this is through the Joint Pacific Multinational Readiness Center. So for the first time in in, in nearly 50 years, the Army has created a combat training center in the Pacific. It's got a campus in Hawaii. It's got a campus in Alaska, 11th Airborne Division, Yukon Donnelly training areas, um, 
high altitude, extreme cold weather, mountainous. We have the Pohakaloa training area. We have major training areas over on the island of Oahu. The distance between the island of Oahu and the big island on the Pohakaloa training area is 130 miles. The distance from the coast of China to Taiwan is about 100 miles. These eight islands, and this archipelago, and that uh, training area up in Alaska looks just like this region. There, it makes no sense, zero sense, for anybody to leave this region and go to NTC, 29 Palms, Nellis Air Force Base, JRTC in Louisiana. Louisiana, Texas, and California don't look anything like this region. Okay, so we're not going that way. We're going that way. And these represent training centers that are in the region already or are being built in the region today. Three years, two years in a row, we brought it to a place called Bataraja here in Indonesia off the southern tip of Sumatra, the island of Sumatra. Last year, we brought it into a place called Townsville in the northeast corner of uh, Australia for Talisman Sabre. That's where the Australians Combat Training Center is. And this year, we'll bring it to a place called Fort Magsaysay, which is one of the EDGA sites in the Philippines, in fact, in just a couple of months. So Joint Pacific Multinational Readiness Center, campus in Hawaii, Tropic Jungle Archipelago, campus in Alaska, high altitude, extreme cold weather, mountainous, and then an exportable version of it that we can bring in and we've brought it in. This will be the fourth year in a row we've done it twice back to back in Indonesia, uh, once in Australia, and uh, this coming year in the Philippines. In fact, I will just uh, add on in the Australia uh, uh, deployment, the live virtual and constructive uh, architecture, the link up of that happened. So we were able to share um, the, uh, the live and constructive and simulated forces that we had in real time between, actually between Hawaii and, uh, and Alaska and back to the National Sim, Sim Center at uh, Fort Leavenworth. That's the first way, training. Why? Because we generate readiness with our forces here. And then the second way that we're achieving the three pillars of the National Defense Strategy, build please, is Operation Pathways. So Operation Pathways is the uh, stitching together of the more than 40 joint and army to army exercises that we do annually anyways. So, so this is the primary uh, effort of campaigning. What is campaigning? Campaigning is the logical and sequential arrangement of operations, activities, and investments to advance U.S. national security objectives and those of our allies and partners. So we're out doing 40 plus joint and army to army exercises. This is adversary focused. It is to gain positional advantage. It is to create staying power. It is to uh, really do primarily three things. Increase joint readiness, because we're training as a joint force. Increase interoperability and confidence with our allies and partners. And two, third thing is to deny key terrain, physical terrain and human terrain against our adversaries, because our adversaries are seeking to seize terrain, both human and physical. Operation path, so generate and build readiness, apply that readiness in the region through pathways. Third build is we need to get forward and we need to build joint interior lines to take time and space away from our adversary to uh, disrupt uh, their timing, uh, to um, build that enduring advantage as uh, as directed as one of the pillars of the national defense strategy. This is actually where we're going to integrate deterrence. 
because again, we're going to be operating with our allies and partners. We do that and only create that by their invitation and with their consent. And those joint interior lines primarily consist of four warfighting functions or systems. Primarily that's command and control, protection, collection, and sustainment. Let me say that again. Command and control, protection, collection, and sustainment. Those four things you need in this region before you can talk about fires and maneuver or maneuver and fires. Because you can put a lot of maneuver out there and you can put a lot of fires out there. But if you can't adequately see to it, if you can't adequately sustain it, if you can't adequately protect it, if you can't adequately collect for it, then those fires and maneuvers are being wasted. They're wasted. So a key enabler to anything you do because of the geometry of this geography is command and control, protection, collection, and sustainment, period. So for all of the enabling capabilities that you leaders lead, those things are first principles out in this region. Those things are also what our allies and partners need from us. That is where we can help. And oh, by the way, anything less than war or conflict, you're gonna need those kinds of capabilities in place to respond to humanitarian assistance, disaster reliefs, or some small scale contingency less than a major war. Okay. Next build. Is that it? Okay, can you take all that off and just go to the map? If you don't mind, go back to the map because then the map will be up there. Okay, so I don't know how much time because I don't see a clock right now, but I think I, I think that took me about 20, 25 minutes. That was a pretty pretty quick thumbnail sketch around the subregions of the theater uh, on at least what the primary threat that that I see. Um, and then a little touch on the national defense strategy on the three pillars, and then the campaign strategy that my boss has with uh, Indo-Pacific Command, and then our three ways of uh, we are contributing, uh, at least as U.S. Army Pacific and TJ Flick to support that campaign plan and the national defense strategy. So if, so if you looked at that at my level as those are some of the ends. Those are the three ways that we're doing it. And then, you know, we got a whole nother conversation going on about the means to do it. So, okay. So I'll pause there. And, uh, okay, let me, let me change gears a little bit um, and talk a little bit about your role uh, as a colonel. And I'll, 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 I'll do this quickly and then we can get to questions. Um, Majors run units. Majors run units. Colonels run armies. And generals should be making decisions. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know about percentages in the other services, and I don't know about percentages in the other armies that are represented here, but for all the army colonels here, there's probably one in the entire lot that's going to be a general. So if you're here thinking you're going to be a general and you're doing all this to be a general, then, you know, forget that. That's not why you're here. That is not why you're here. A colonel, we need really good colonels. We need your skills. We need your experience. We need your background. We need your education. We need your thinking. Really, we need your leadership. You're going, to run, you're going to be asked to run large organizations. Brigade and, and colonel level command is nothing like battalion level command. Battalion command is the last best job in the Army. Okay? It's the last best job. Next to division command, but, you know, I'm, I'm just, be honest, like most people are not going to command a division. Okay? Maybe four in one year group. That's it. So it's just, it's not in the cards for most people. So, but colonel level command of all the jobs as a colonel, 
Kernel command is the best job because the rest of them just suck. Okay, they're just hard. They're just hard jobs because you're sitting at that seam between flag officers and then the highest end of the rest of the force to include not just the officer corps, but the warrant officer corps and the non-commissioned officer corps. So you run the army. So you have to get yourself into position to have the greatest amount of influence at that scene. And your education here and your experiences up to this date are gonna be incredibly helpful. But you're gonna be asked a lot. You're gonna to have to give a lot. And there's gonna become a point in your time where you're gonna say, hey, is this the best place for me to be serving? And my counsel to all of you is that if you were asked before what you want to do and your response was, whatever you tell me to do, sir, like those days are over. They're over. You need to have an answer on where you can best serve. Now, there may be family considerations. There may be personal considerations. There may be a whole range of considerations. You've got aging parents. Believe me, I know I've lost four. Since I've been in uniform, they're no longer with me. Um, you got kit. I mean, there's all kinds of things out there. Particularly at this age in your life. But you're going to have to make a choice and say, hey, this is where I think I can best serve the Army, given my background, experiences, education, or even my energy and passion for that particular topic, matter, position, command, mission, whatever that case might be. I guess the point I'm making is that if you thought a lot was expected of you before, think again, because we really, really need your help. We really need colonels to operate at the colonel level. We really need colonels to give direction and guidance to those below them. We really need colonels to speak candidly, frankly, informed, and give your best estimates to general officers. The better science that commanders can get or general officer can get, then the more artful we can be in decisions. Without that, we're we're going to we're going to struggle mightily. So if you have some questions about that, happy to talk about the profession, your role, officership, um, and kind of you know taking the year that you have here, the academic year that you have here to kind of uh, reframe um, your role because it's going to be it's going to change upon arrival out in the force. Okay, I'll stop there and take any questions that anyone has at this particular point. And I know it's, what day of the week is it on? Is it Tuesday or Wednesday? Is it for Tuesday? Tuesday, all right, so you had yesterday to get warmed up. Yes, sir, please. And, it, and you can just stay where you're at and just yell, it's fine. Oh, I'm sorry, okay, sorry. Then you'll have to go to a mic, my bad. So line up around the mics. I'm expecting people to just come on up around the mics. Let's go. Let's go. Hey, sir, Nate Williams, uh, Hi, Nate. Uh, 22. I'm an infantry officer, but I kind of have a more of a logistic and sustainment question. Uh, okay. Specifically, uh, I kind of look at the protection and the sustainment as probably the hardest challenges. Yep. And that combined with the agile combat employment uh, concept. Yep. Um, what do you think is the our biggest struggle or, or challenge that, that faces the Army? Uh, in sustaining um, a fight in a kind of a, a conventional manner. So. Are you so you're asking me like relative to agile combat employment of what the Air Force's concept is? Yes, sir. Okay. So, and I've had conversations with General uh, Wilsbach on this. So, the limb fact for them, and this is from him, is class three and class five. So, gas and ammunition. And, and I would add protection. 
because I don't think that Red Horse is going to be an adequate security force if you're going to open and close these airfields for extended periods of time, depending on how many airfields you have and what type of airfield, size, capacity, MOG, et cetera, et cetera. And then what you intend to do from it. So this is, this is an important part. When I talk about protection, um, I'm talking about everything from uh, engineering, from mobility, counter mobility, survivability. I'm talking about um, counter UAS to short Shorad to mid tier with Patriot to upper tier with Thad. Uh, I'm talking about medical, both our forces and 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 surrounding forces. I'm talking about host nation agreements to make sure that we don't abuse our access basing and overflight or misuse that access basing and overflight. So this is a role where I do think our doctrine of multi-domain operations needs to come together with agile combat employment, which I don't know if one of the Air Force officers in here could. I don't think, do you have doctrine on ACE? Anybody in the Air Force here can answer that? Yeah, I get one of these. That means no, you don't. The answer is no. So, so this is an important point though. We have all these concepts. I'm now I'm drifting a little bit, but I'm, I'm going to take the opportunity to say this. The Army had multi-domain battle, and then it went to multi-domain operations. We had a concept, now we have doctrine. For those of you that think that just landed from two years ago, it didn't. That, that work started back in like 2010, 2011, okay? So that developed beyond a decade, and it drove some of our modernization decisions. So there's a Naval officer standing right there, do you have doctrine for DMO or EABO? Maybe one of the Marines can answer that. Yes or no? Yes, sir. You have doctrine? Yes, sir. Really? What's the number of that document? Do you know? I, could not tell you, sir. <laughs> I didn't know that. I'm shocked that the Navy actually has doctrine, but that's you guys. I got a Marine officer down here in front. You got a manual? Is it a doctrinal manual? Is standing forces doctrine? Huh? No, it's a concept, I think. I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm asking, right? Okay, so these concepts are really good, but at some point they gotta get out of concept and they gotta get into like doctrine so we can start applying that. Not, you know, not that it is rote, but it has to be kinda, we gotta kinda agree on this stuff, so. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, uh, Michael Margolius from Carlisle Scholars, sir. And uh, regarding the Arctic, yes. what are your biggest unknowns that you see that you want explored um uh, I, yeah so i think the biggest unknown is i don't back to concepts i don't know if the joint force has a concept an operational warfighting concept of how we intend to operate train and fight in the arctic <clears throat> <clears throat> i tell my forces actually in Hawaii and Alaska, but I'll, I'll say this in Alaska because we're doing the war game here, is that if you cannot live and operate in that environment, you cannot fight. It is a precursor to actually being able to fight. So it, the same would be true in the jungle. If you can't live first, operate second, then you can't fight. You can't just go and say, I can fight in the jungle or I can fight in the Arctic. What, well, what are the capabilities? What are the concepts that you have tested? What are the, what, what is, does your material actually function at 20 below zero? If the answer to that question is no, then you can't fight. So the thing I'm concerned about is, I think that we talk a lot about what we can do, and then when we actually have to do it, there's a big, there's a big difference. And I'm not in the talking anymore. We got to actually go do it and prove it. So we need an operational warfighting concept in the Arctic, and we need to be able to test that concept to then 
stress capabilities, and then that will evolve over time. But we got to start now. And I won't go into, you know, we, we used to do this stuff quite regularly. But, you know, we got busy doing other things and, you know, the wolf nearest the sled gets the attention. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Sir, given the importance. I'm expecting somebody else to line up over here, which would be back and forth. Given the importance of our partners now as in the region, how do you overcome interoperability challenges specific to variances in intelligence capabilities with, when exercising and then fighting? Okay. Um, so interoperability. <clears throat> There's a lot of things to a lot of people, but let me let me frame it for you how I how I think about it, or, or at least how I think I learned about it. So interoperability actually has three types. There's human interoperability, there's technical interoperability, and then there's procedural interoperability. And you actually have to have the human interoperability. That's kind of a precursor to the technical and procedural. So let me explain each of these, okay? And I'll explain the human one last. A technical interoperability is we share HIMARS or we share 155s or we share M1 tanks or we share pick a platform, okay? That, that technical interoperability is made much easier if you have weapon systems that are similar or, or exactly the same. If you take that and then you go to procedural interoperability, like calls for fire, medevac, you know, whatever those procedures are that we use, then that is another type of interoperability. The most important of the three is human interoperability. And this is where like the trust factor comes in and the ability to actually work together, get to know one another and understand one another's organizations. So in an odd way, we want to, and it's okay to sell capabilities to our friends and allies, because then the technical interoperability that we gain is increased, which then makes it easier for procedural interoperability to be increased. But you still have to have the human interoperability first, and that comes through a relationship with the with those countries. So specifically to your question, I think the gains that uh, we have made in the region on information sharing agreements um, is one of the more profound gains that have been made on, at least on the Intel side. And then I would say a close uh, second or maybe kind of tied for first would be the uh, the gains that are being made on expanding a uh, a mission partner environment, the ability to communicate uh, in in an open architecture uh, that is a ve very very different today than it was when I was in the region in fourteen to eighteen as a two star. So when I when, and I see the I can. And I'll, I'll, I'll go maybe into this in, uh, a little bit later toward the tail end. But I mean, I, you know, I, I can look at this region from 2014 to 2024 because I have essentially been in it the damn near the whole time with the exception of three years as a G357 back in Washington, D.C. I've been a division commander, a deputy commander of this headquarters uh, came back to Washington, D.C., but even in Washington, D.C. is the G357 because the priorities were what they were. I was paying a lot of attention to China and the region, and then I went back out in 21 to command. So I would say specifically to is information sharing agreements we have made gains on, and I think that the advances that we're making with mission partner environment and a open architecture to do that, and a lot of those have been gains that we've seen made elsewhere in the world um, and the speed that that needs to happen at. That's a very, very complex. First of all, again, back to the geometry of the geography, distances matter out here. Um, and so there, there's, and, and you don't have a, a NATO, I'll say network. You're gonna have to do some buy and then do some multi stuff just as quickly as you possibly can. And that ties up a lot of, 
uh, access agreements and legalities and 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 really protect and defend networks that you got to be careful of. So thanks for the question. Yes, sir. Hey, sir. Colonel Chris Winnell, uh, Center R6, Air Force guy. Um, I can tell. Yes, sir. Uh, so <laughs> no, no dumb questions, only dumb colonels completely understand that. But uh, looking at your uh, AO here, I noticed you're missing a continent of Antarctica. So the question to you is, yeah. anything you want on your staff that's kind of focused on the current and future challenges that China and Russia yeah. have on that continent? Yeah. None. I mean, we, we're, we're, I, I don't have any assets in, in Antarctica. Copy, sir. And I know there's some, I know there's some work going on down there from Australia and New Zealand, but beyond that, I'm not aware of any. Copy. Thank you. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, my name is Doug Simmons from uh, Seminar Three. Uh -huh. uh, I had to ask a two-part question because that's a, that's kind of a thing here in the War College. <laughs> um, first, sir, I wanted to ask. Uh, you mentioned briefly about uh, JPMRC, and so my question focuses on uh, ex uh, exercises. Mm -hmm. One, um, I wanted to ask you if you uh, what role do you see the land forces in one fostering innovation <clears throat> in land forces yep. and through the exercise? Yeah. Of, procedures and then two how do you see the land forces creating uh or fostering creativity to solve joint war or war fighting problems okay great um well i tell my force all the time that every exercise has to have an experiment and every experiment has to have an exercise they're not they should not be you not you should not have a series of experiments going on that are not involved in an exercise and i recognize that you know, there's some RDT and E and some some tests that have to be done to test a weapon system not in an operation for safety, you know, stability, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I think that weaving these together in a very uh, deliberate, thoughtful um, way is an important aspect of what we're doing out here. Let me go to the second part of your question. Um, so J P M R C. I would tell you, and this is not a criticism of the other training centers in Louisiana uh, and California, but we are surrounded by joint assets in Hawaii and Alaska, surrounded by them, okay? Just Hawaii alone. All the combatant commanders, our component commanders, are uh, uber right away from the combatant commander, and you have a range of tactical units out there. Third MLR from the Marine Corps, um, there's uh, ODA teams from SOC PAC, you've got surface action groups coming through there from PAC fleet, you've got subs out there, you've got a full division. I mean, I could just go on, and the same thing in Alaska. So. If you want joint training, <laughs> then and you're and we are surrounded by joint assets and the multinational partners from the region, as I depicted earlier, not only is there a thirst for this stuff in the region, this environment and that environment is more in agreement with the with the environment and the conditions that exist in the region. It's also cheaper for them to move to Hawaii and Alaska to train. So the J and the M in JPMRC is invaluable on creating interoperability, on dialing in experiments, on taking new concepts and capabilities. And from those new concepts and capabilities, then you create real either new organizations, new procedures, or new opportunities for interoperability. So to me, this is like a gold mine here and here and then in the region to be able to have a con be in a continuous continuous transformation like general george talks about where experiments are uh, capitalizing on the exercises and the exercises are capitalizing on the experiments and you continue to move so that's that's where i think you know this is this is what's important about concept work coming together with uh, new capabilities 
those two things have to merge together with the operational force. Otherwise, it's just sitting in a laboratory in an incubator all the time. The operational force has to be deeply involved in experiments. Experiments cannot be left to scientists alone. <laughs> they have to be given to pra practitioners in a very real environment. Because if they're not put in the hands of a soldier, you actually don't know if the thing's going to work or not. That Morning, answer sir. your question? Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Lieutenant Colonel Rick Luce, uh, Caller Scholar Program. Uh, got a question, sir. When, when we talk about the interconnectedness of the South Pacific, specifically with trade, finances, uh, how much uh, gains China's made over the last you know decade yeah. or so. Yeah. And, and then when we talk about our integrated occurrence and uh, you know campaigning and then building that enduring yeah. position of advantage, yeah. are we seeing some gains, especially when it comes to ABO, um, State yeah. Department work, um, yeah. you know, the amount of uh, infrastructure yeah. that's required to build those? Yeah. Uh, and a lot of that's out of the Army's perspective. Yeah. And then kind of the second part is, mm -hmm. what's the resolve of the allies and partners as being in that competitive space, considering yeah. how, how tied they are to China? Yeah. Yeah. So this is like, this is a really important, like the, 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 um, so first of all, um, China has been on a, I would describe it as a incremental and insidious path for at least for the decade that I've been deeply involved in the region, but some would argue probably for 30 plus years. Okay. Now I'm going to add another word here recently that starts with I. Their behavior is irresponsible right now. And candidly, it's, it's, some of it is very dangerous. So, so I believe that, um, and you know, I talked about the arsenal that they've created when in sort of 2014 and 15, their, their reorganization and their modernization the reorganization of the theaters caught up with the modernization, and then they began to train, okay? Because here's the other lens that I get to see, because I can rewind the tape to 2014. When I think about what they were doing from 2014 to 2018 when I left, and then I, I actually had access to more stuff as I became a three-star in the Pentagon, I just wasn't in the region. And then I come back out in the region in 21, and I have the benefit of being able to watch them closely from 21 to 23, now 24. When I see what they're doing today relative to what they were doing a decade ago, that is a very, very dangerous trajectory that they are on. Very dangerous. So that's the seriousness of the situation. This is the irresponsible activity, okay, from you know, air intercepts, maritime intercepts, the response, the response to the Pelosi visit, the response to uh, the visit in California. This is this is not the region doesn't like that. And 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 they are, I believe that their reaction to that irresponsible type of behavior and that irresponsible type of behavior is the insidious and incremental part of the violation of their national sovereignty and their territorial integrity. And when that happens, the countries in this region, candidly, the countries in the world, have every right to defend their sovereignty, their territorial integrity, and that's what they're doing. And so there are a lot of gains that have been made. I mean, South Korea, Japan, the Philippines, Australia, a number of the island nations out in Oceania. Uh, we just signed a comprehensive strategic partnership with Indonesia. We just signed a comprehensive strategic partnership with Vietnam. Um, I think the relationship, at least, you know, with, uh, and I think there's a couple of Indian officers in here between the U.S. and India. I was just there in September. Um, I, one, one just came into my head because I was just in Hanoi, Vietnam in November. If somebody would have told me in 21 that I was going to see my, the Viet, 
Vietnamese army um, uh, chief, they call him the land force commander, <clears throat> three times in four months in 23. If they had told me that in 21, I'd have said, you're crazy. But that happened. And we just signed a comprehensive strategic partnership with Vietnam. So I guess the point I'm making is that I think the reaction of the region is one where they don't like that kind of behavior. And, and, and I think actually what's happened in Europe and now what's happening in the Middle East is giving everybody great concern as it should be. And so I think that the work that we are doing in the region, while there's miles to march before we rest, there has been a number of gains. Now, I'm also gonna be very cautious because um, you know this requires work every day and there's challenges too. As I mentioned up here in, in South Asia, I mean, situation in Cambodia and Laos and Bhutan and Nepal and Bangladesh and Miramar, that's this this is 10 countries and 2 billion people. Let me say that again. 10 countries, 2 billion people. <laughs> okay? And and guess what? Guess what's the dominant force in here? Say it. Armies. Armies. No, no I'm serious. Let me go on this a minute. Like Vietnam, is there anyone any is there an officer in here from Vietnam? Okay. So big discussion about the South China Sea and trade off the coast of Vietnam because they are nine dash line, all right? So, but trade or their economy in Vietnam, it's not existential <laughs> to their economy if trade doesn't happen in the South China Sea for, in, for the country of Vietnam. What does matter are the borders of Cambodia, Laos, and China because much of their trade actually goes across the border and much of the illicit traffic that comes in. Remember that Mekong River thing that I was showing before? Okay, so they have to secure their borders because they're trying to prevent illicit activity of all types coming across and then they need to be able to trade over land because that's where their economy runs off of. And 70% of their population lives basically along the coastline because this, this border right here is basically a mountain. Remember Highway 1? The study of the Vietnam War? I mean, that, there's a lot of it that was an unconventional war, but there was some conventional stuff going on too. But that's another story. Good? Okay. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, good morning. Colonel Brian Seclunin with the Advanced Strategic Arts Program. Uh, as so you're in your second year here? <laughs> is that right? No, sir. Oh, it's our first year. Okay, okay. Yeah. Sir, uh, as you uh, mentioned about uh, the allies and partners in the region kind of looking westward into Europe, uh, in your interactions with uh, with those strategic leaders, how much of them are looking that way in, in, your, in terms of Ukraine and Russia? And then if uh, U.S. resolve to support Ukraine to defeat Russia, if it were to, or if we were to end our, our support to Ukraine, what do you foresee in the theater? Okay, let me let me frame your question. I think what you're asking me is how do the regional leaders, at least my counterparts, view what's going on in Europe yes, relative to Russia and Ukraine fighting? Um, well, I mean, they are uh, they don't want it to come to a theater near them. Um, they're concerned about it. Uh, they are concerned again about some of the irresponsible behavior and activity that's going on in the region. Um, and I think that that creates challenges for them, you know, domestically, politically, and obviously from a security standpoint. Um, I think that it, uh, I, I think that we are all you know, the region and us are all looking into the, the lens of those, um, those fights, those limited regional wars, 
and pulling uh, observations out of it and then applying those to our own forces and then our own uh, capabilities and organizations. One of the, one of the things that, uh, uh, you know, my observation from the region, so the, the primary arms dealer in this part of the world for the better part of 50 years has been the former Soviet Union and now Russia. And one of the things that the, at least I, my view on this is the leaders in the region, my counterparts in the region, um, look at what systems are being used in uh, Europe and, and the Ukraine fight, and they look at the U.S. stuff and they say it works because some of that stuff from Russia does not. And there's no tail to it. I'm going to tell you a quick story. I was on, uh, I'll call it a landing zone. I won't state the country. And there were four MI-17s there, and there were four UH-60s and two Apaches there. And I said to the, it was a three-star general. I said to the general, I said, how, how, how are the, how you doing, you know, with your, proficiency for the 17s, your pilots, you know, parts, et cetera, et cetera. He said, they flew them here and they dropped them off 10 years ago. But we've never seen them. Now, we may be expensive and uh, we may take a while because <laughs> sometimes that's the way our ac acquisition stuff works, but it works. And it's combat proven. So, you know, you want it quick and you want it cheap, you're taking some risk. Now, you know, but they have, each of these countries have their own industrial base that they need to be concerned about, and they got to generate things out of their own industrial base. And um, so I think that's one of the things that they're taking away. I also think that one of the things they're taking away is uh, the importance of like planning, synchronization, and coordination of, 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 of joint elements and being able to do, you know, sort of combined arms maneuver. Um, and then the training required in order to do that. I think that's a, another important element that's being, um, you know, whether it's learned, that means it was, you changed something in your organization, but I definitely think they are observing that and, and that is having an impact. Good, thanks. I'll come right back, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Durham, Army Reserve CBRN officer from Seminar 5. You mentioned integrated deterrence as one of the pillars of the national security strategy. How do you measure success? And do you feel, uh, where do you need, feel we need to focus our efforts in, if improvement is needed? Yeah, so success is no war. I mean, really, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's we, we already have two limited regional wars. So, the goal out there is no war. We can't, mankind cannot afford another war out there. It would be tragic in so, so many ways. Um, and so I feel that the, the, that's why this, this work that we do with the international community and in this region, our allies and partners to try to maintain peace, safety, security, stability is, is so important. And so every, every day out there, we have to create a sense of confidence in one another that, uh, that we're reliable we're credible and that they are reliable and credible in trying to achieve that outcome. Um, and, you know, I think talking is important. I think being there is important. And I think listening is important. And sometimes our greatest problem in the United States is we don't listen and we need to listen. 
We need to listen to what's happening in the region. We need to understand what's happening in the region. We need to hear what they have to say. And I think that that will go a long way in just being able to keep 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 uh, keep peace and bit. Okay. All right. So let me get. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good morning, sir. Morning. Uh, this is Osman. I'm from Bangladesh Army, sir. Um, El General Shahafuddin. Sir, I was your contacting officer when you visited last year to Bangladesh for five, six days. And so no, you don't one, recognize one full me. country. Yes, you don't recognize me probably for now, so because I, I became a little fairer than before <laughs> because of the snowfall in Carlisle. <laughs> or I don't know, I'm not sure, but the uh, study load of our college may have also changed as the <laughs> appearance a little bit. So, so sir, uh, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. Uh, but my question is that the, as, as you mentioned, that the volatile behavior that we see from the Chinese part is very, in recently we see that all the time in the news. Yeah. And that's how the South China Sea is a very hot place now. But if we see the developments of the People's Liberation Army, PLA, recent few years, these are huge, sir. If I, if I say the defense budget from less than 100 billion, it has, for 2023, it is 400. Then the nuclear warheads and increased three, four times more. The recruitment procedure they have changed, and the salary for the officers and soldiers have increased probably five times. Yeah. So uh, and they will be fighting a war if they need to in the South China Sea, which is very closer to their. Uh, yeah. So, in response to these specific items, do you think some things has to be done? Uh, on on your part, particularly uh, the U.S. Army Pacific, sir. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think, thank you for the question. Uh, so I think the, uh, I think the, the ways that I was describing about training together, creating opportunities for interoperability, building confidence in one another. I mean, I, I think that that is a very important um, uh, part of what we're trying to do in the region to, to deter and usher our our allies and partners and the region to maintain some peace and stability. I I, I would also tell you that um, I think there's four things uh, that President Xi is having to assess of whether he you know attempts to try an invasion of Taiwan. And the first thing he's doing is I think he's assessing you know, can China withstand the economic sanctions that the international community in the U.S. have placed on Russia? What What's the impact of that? Again, I'm not an economist, but that's got to be foremost in his mind. The second thing he's doing is I, and I witness this, and I'm sure you do too, and other uh, officers here in the region from the Indo-Pacific region, is their effort to double down on fragmenting and fracturing the network of allies and partners and the interoperability opportunities that the U.S. creates in the region. Because the, the more they can fragment us and fracture us, the better it is for them. The third thing, and you're probably aware of this, you know, recently in the media, is I believe that he is assessing the military proficiency of his force to conduct a highly, highly complex operation. Going across that strait is not easy, <laughs> okay? It's a, that, that requires precision, it requires timing, it requires planning, coordination, synchronization, it requires a joint force, it requires a lot. So I'm not saying they're 10 feet tall. What I'm saying is he's got to assess his military leaders and their proficiency to actually conduct that operation. And then the last thing he's doing is I think he's assessing, he's got to win the information war. He's got to continue to work on portraying the United States as a declining, unrelying, unreliable power and that they are an ascending reliable power. And so we have to work every day, I think, to push back on all of that. 
I think I have time for one more. And by the way, I've now had an Air Force officer, Army officer, Naval officer. So now the Marines have a question. Sure. Good morning, Lieutenant Good Colonel Connors from Seminar 2.2. Uh, DOD is clearly preparing for a, a, a fight in the Indo-Pacific, but what do you think the nation needs to prioritize to prepare us to, to, to deter and win if necessary? Um, I, yeah, well, I mean, you know, it's not my job to, about the, but I guess what I would offer is, uh, I mean, I do think that, you know, so we have from the Obama administration to the Trump administration, to the Biden administration, to, I believe the next, I mean, there's been pretty consistent support for this region being the most consequential region at the most consequential time against the most consequential adversary. So I think a, a broad recognition that, th that what this threat represents is uh, and could be uh, existential to our way of life and the way of life of freedom loving people. So, if we can create a sense of that in our in our country, uh, I think that that would be I think that would be very helpful. And as a result of that, if if that means people want to serve your community, want to serve in service, want to serve the public good, as a result of preserving our way of life, then I think that that would be. We would strike a blow for freedom there. So that would be a good thing. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes. I mean, you guys, you got you don't want to go back to class, so I know why you're asking. <laughs> civilians. Uh DFAS, sir. Yes. Oh, good. Uh, so you spoke a lot about uh integrated deterrence and winning the information war from China's perspective. And so right now, our seminar today is about the cyber war. And you spoke about how they're really trying to attack us from that domain. Uh, given that information, do you feel like that the current structure in, for cyber within the United States is sufficient um, to maintain superiority in that space? Or should we establish a cyber force? Well, we have a cyber force. Um... Do I think it's sufficient? I mean, I think we can always, I think we could always add capability. This is an area I think that we we can't rest on our laurels and it's it's constantly um, evolving, the threat and our capabilities. Um, so, I mean, I just think that, uh, I actually think there's an education role here that we need to get more uh, literate in electronic warfare, the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, data literacy, um, uh, open uh, architecture, uh, language skills. Uh, I mean, and what I mean by that is uh, balancing between, you know, like you know, your 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 technical understanding of the systems versus your operational application of those technical skills. And uh, and I think we need to start at a much much more junior level, and 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 I would say the more senior people need to listen to what's happening at the junior level in that domain and and across that spectrum. So there's a lot of gains that would be made from that. So I think we could do a better job. I got to ask this question yesterday. I think we could do a better job of um, in our institutional part of the army training and education and leader development, I think we, we could do a better job there. I, I had no formal training in it. It was OJT or things that came at you on the battlefield. Um, and you learn very quick when others are getting maimed and killed around you. So it gives you a sense of urgency to figure it out. And I, I guess that's been the impetus for, for at least my generation to do. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I'll end by saying that, Oh, sorry. Yep. Yeah. They're asking questions. Sorry, sir. Sorry, it, 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 All one right. last one. Yeah, yeah, so, go uh, for uh, it. Colonel Mike Flurry, uh, 7R10. 
Yeah. Uh, thank you for your time and the brief today. Yeah. Uh, so recently we talked about uh, the Pacific Deterrence Initiative. Yeah. And Congress's <laughs> desire uh, yeah, for a standing expeditionary force. Can you talk standing a standing little... expeditionary force? Yes, sir. Uh, can Can you talk a little bit about JTF Micronesia? Uh, and how you see it kind of integrating and operating there in the region? Still to be determined. Yes, sir. Yeah, I don't know if I want to get out ahead of that. So it's, I think we're, I mean, so the JMD was approved by the Joint Staff. We, ha in fact, I have a colonel who's out there right now in Guam who's the chief of staff. So it's, it's, it's not IOC, but it's moving to IOC. I think the rules and functions were still we're still kind of having a uh, um, we're having a discussion about what exactly is going to be its roles and functions, and I and I think we have some time before we have to make a decision on that. Now, PDI, that's a totally you went all over the map there, man. You're like, <laughs> it's, it's what we do here. Yeah, yeah. The, P, uh, the PDI, um, it's uh, it, so we're. You know, it's like a it's like a apples to lettuce discussion on EDI and PDI. They're not the same, and they were birthed totally differently. Um, so, um, and that that's true in the army. So it's a it's a little bit of a shaded contest there. So. But that's where I'm going tomorrow for the next two days to do do battle on budget. So, yeah, a little they're a little different in their definition of each other. So, but thanks. But yes, we do need the resources. <laughs> All right, I think that's it. Well, listen, let me end by saying thank you again for what you've done, and congratulations to all of you for being here. But I also will. I also will warn you that uh, the years that you're going to continue to serve at the, what I would say is, you know, sort of the highest end, um, the top end of my term, our, our field grade force, like you're going to be asked to run and lead large organizations. and. The cumulative impacts of your experiences, your education, your training are, are going to require you to put all of that in play in the roles that you're going to perform in. And if you are given the opportunity to command as a colonel, cherish it. Because <laughs> when you're done with that, you're going into really hard jobs before that and after that. So enjoy that spell in command, but I will tell you, we need really, really good colonels. And I'm, again, I'm, you can translate this into your own particular service or, or branch or, um, or army. Colonels, in my view, run the army. Generals should be making decisions you have to help us make those decisions by all the hard work that you will you will bring to bear and allow majors to run units. You've got to help us run the army and we need your expertise. So find where you can best serve, find where your skills give the greatest return on investment and go there and do a great job because we really, really need you. Okay. Have a great 2024. Thanks for being here today. Army Colonel State.